Hello, and welcome to the next segment in the history of Christianity. Today, we'll be looking at the years 1500 to 1700, Reform and the Disciplines. In 1517, Latin Christendom was a united whole, a single church under the headship of the Bishop of Rome, or the Pope, who oversaw a vast network of bishops who acknowledged one another's legitimacy, dotted with active monasteries. After Martin Luther confronted the hierarchy of these institutions, first with his 95 Theses that year of 1517, 31st of October, and then after his condemnation at the Diet of Worms in 1521, where he may have said, here I stand, I can do no other. Nothing would be the same again. In 1600, not only were there bishops who did not recognize each other's legitimacy, there were national churches toying with the idea of abolishing bishops altogether. The monks in these Protestant nations had fared worse than the bishops, though. Some were merely expelled from their monasteries. But in London, for example, the abbot of the Charter House was drawn and quartered for treason. FYI, Carthusians, those who dwell in Charter Houses, Carthusians take a vow of silence and tend to be left alone by kings unless the king is out for monastic blood. Eastern Christianity, under, on the other hand, had no reformation. By 1520, most Eastern Christians lived under Muslim rule, with the whole of the former Eastern Roman Empire, as well as parts of Hungary, Austria, and Ukraine, modern Ukraine, under Ottoman rule, and with Christianity extinct in China and most of Central Asia, only the Middle Eastern Christians and the Martoma Christians of India, one of the few churches that received little trouble in its history, remained. I think the political and intellectual circumstances of East and West, not only around the year 1500, but throughout the Middle Ages, can explain why there was no Orthodox Reformation. Although Cyril Lucaris was a Calvinist patriarch of Constantinople, he was strangled in 1638 and thrown in the Bosporus, and Ossetius of Jerusalem wrote the closest document the Orthodox have to a modern confession of faith as a response to Cyril's own Reformed confession. Sticking to the theme of spiritual disciplines and the expansion of Christianity, I plan to address three tropic topics today. One, the Reformation and the spiritual disciplines. Two, Catholic and Orthodox, 1500 to 1700, oh too briefly. And three, European missionary expansion. Let's go. If you know the history of theology, you'll know that one of the most important rallying cries of the Reformation was and is justification by faith alone, arising in the works of Martin Luther, um, particularly in his 1520 on Christian freedom, and expressed in his Bible commentaries on Romans and on Galatians. You might therefore think that a form of Christianity that has its roots in the works of a man who says that justifi justification by faith is the whole gospel would be a Christianity that rejects the spiritual disciplines. After all, didn't Protestants dissolve monasteries and grow really long beards in the 1500s? While there were some who would embrace a rejection of the spiritual disciplines, many did not. Indeed, the death of monasticism in Protestant Europe was for some an opportunity for asceticism to go home with the ordinary Christian. Since we only have 20 minutes in this video, I will restrict myself to, very briefly, Luther, Calvin, and a bit longer since I was baptized and confirmed one of them, the Anglicans. First, then, Luther. Two weeks ago, in my video about late ancient Christianity, I talked about the origins of monasticism. I gave as a definition of a monk the following. A Christian who is single-minded in devotion to God and who has chosen to live a life apart from the rest of the world devoted to asceticism. Last week, we saw that many monks in their pursuit of God became missionaries. And if we take away the part where a monk lives a life apart from the rest of the world, Franciscans, Dominicans, and Augustinian friars are monks as well, serving the world alongside a life of prayer and discipline. Luther was an Augustinian friar of a particular medieval stereotype, not therefore meant to represent all of medieval monks. That of the over-anxious pursuer of monkery, to use an English rendering of one of his own words, who fears for his eternal soul. Justification by faith was liberation for his soul, 
when he began really articulating it, especially in the 1520s. Greg Peters has done some good work sifting through what Luther and also Calvin have to say about monasticism, and it turns out that both of them are in favor of ascetic practices, of spiritual training, of the spiritual disciplines. What they are not in favor of is lifelong vows. There's nothing wrong with celibacy, poverty, with living in community, with stability, with obedience, unless avowed for your whole life or seen as an essential for salvation. That, they argue, is unscriptural. Both Luther and Calvin, moreover, were promoters of the disciplined Christian life. This, to be brief, is because the reformers, like the best ancient and medieval thinkers, saw salvation holistically, the Christian life as a whole. People are not just saved from hell when they are justified by faith. They are saved for heaven, saved for Christ and the knowing of him. Whatever things can strengthen knowing Christ and living morally are recommended. I would like to take this moment to offer my sincerest apologies to Martin Luther for implying that moral living had anything to do with what he was interested in. This is simply not the case. They were more excited about knowing God. Moral living, like the spiritual disciplines, was simply the sort of thing you did to know God better, or a result of knowing God. Thank you very much. Amongst John Calvin's many writings, an extract from his Institutes has been termed the Golden Booklet of the True Christian Life. This little book sets out the motivation for holiness, laying out principles how to reach high heights. I've been wanting to read it for years, but I haven't yet. So I'll sort of just leave it there, except from what I've heard about it, this book is an extended meditation on suffering and on glory, on Christ and the Christian life, and it should torpedo the expectations of what a Calvinist sounds like if you got those expectations from certain corners of the internet. Now, the English Reformation. First things first. Henry VIII, in the 1530s, created a political situation that made room for reform. And this especially happened under his son Edward VI, and then later on, his second daughter, Elizabeth I. And men like Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, from 1533 to 1555, they were readers of Luther and Calvin and the Continental Reformers. Whatever motivations the king may have had, and they don't seem to have been the purest, people like Cranmer were genuinely interested in Reformation, in things like, say, priests who were married, Priests with big beards. Now, th that's actually a thing, surprisingly. For some reason, in the canon law of the Middle Ages, um, within the Latin Church, if you were a priest who was not a member of a religious order, like the Benedictines or the Franciscans or whomever, you weren't allowed to grow a beard. Weird fact. So this means that if you look at people like Cranmer, John Knox, they have these big, huge beards, and that's why back on track. The most endearing book to come from the English Reformation is the Book of Common Prayer, and one major component of it promoted the spiritual disciplines, matins and evensong as they are called in the first BCP from 1549, of which I am holding a 20th century reprint. As I mentioned in my first video, as early as the late first century Didache, it was recommended for Christians to pray three times daily and the practice of morning, noon, and evening prayers was part of the piety of Judaism in the time of Jesus himself. And it extended to non-monastic Christians throughout the early centuries of the church. It was in fact practiced in the Middle Ages by many lay people. We have loads of what they called books of hours to help them through this. So creating daily offices for Protestants was not therefore a medieval holdover, but reforming an ancient tradition, which is sort of what I would say the Church of England Reformation, the, what becomes the mainstream there, is really aiming at, is reviving what they thought was best practice of the ancient church. Cranmer maintained morning and evening prayer, trimmed them of their fat, and translated them into English. The basic skeleton of the two, two offices is not so different from how they were prayed in Latin in Britain at the time of the Reformation. And all English clergy were, and are to this day, including their Canadian brothers and sisters, we required to pray matins and evensong every 
day. As with Benedict, so in Thomas Cranmer's prayer book, the Psalms are the heart of the office. Cranmer's biggest change, besides suppressing all but one non-scriptural hymn, was the addition of a large quantity of Bible reading at the office. Following the historic calendar of the Book of Common Prayer at these two offices takes the prayer through the Old Testament once and the New Testament twice over the course of a year, and the Book of Psalms every single month. At the very heart of the Reformation of England's prayer life was the Bible. And although some today called Puritans called for more radical reform under Elizabeth I, she was a strong king, and she would step only so far. And in her reign, the greatest work of Anglican theology possibly ever written was published, Richard Turker's On the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. And just a, a bit of shameless self-promotion, if you're interested in the relationship between justification and sanctification, and how understanding the English Reformation better can fuel the spiritual disciplines, you should read my recently published article in Ad Fontes magazine, to which I link in the description below. Add over. So anyway, when James the Sixth of Scotland became James the First of England, um, Episcopal governance, liturgical worship, sacramental piety, and the centrality of Scripture became cemented in the Church of England to a large extent because people had been reading Hooker only in fact, to be shifted by something as unimaginable as cutting off the king's head. Oh. Well. The most interesting thing about King Charles I is that he was 5 foot 6 inches tall at the start of his reign, but only 4 foot 8 inches tall at the end of it. Because of Oliver Cromwell. And I will not go into the singing. After Cromwell's Presbyterian protectorate in the 1650s, Charles I was beheaded in 1649, came the restoration of Charles II in 1660. In this era, Anglicanism produced some of its greatest aesthetic works. Purcell's music, the 1662 BCP, there's my copy of it, a 20th century printing. If you're curious, I also have the Scottish prayer book from 1928 and the Canadian prayer book from 1962, because that's the kind of person I am. And St. Paul's Cathedral in London are also from this era, as well as the work of Jeremy Taylor. Now, one of the many things the Puritans from the days of Hooker through the Cromwellians complained about was the straightforward badness of so many Church of England prelates. Ambitious, worldly men, unfit for pastoral work, were given the cure of souls. Jeremy Taylor is not one of them. He suffered under the protectorate, and went into exile. Upon the restoration of King Charles II, Taylor was made a bishop in Ireland. Having had the externals of his religion stripped from him, he found what was truly essential to the Christian life, and he wrote about it in a book called The Rule and Exercises of Holy Living, to which there's a sequel, Holy Dying. It's a difficult and extraordinary book that goes through the various aspects of life and makes the reader meditate on them in the light of the pursuit of holiness. One principle that emerges from Taylor's work, and which characterizes Protestants who practice the disciplines, is that no discipline is required of Christians save prayer and the ordinances of holy baptism and holy communion, all of which scripture commands. But everything else, even if Taylor might couch it in terms of command and what one should do, is ultimately optional. The only reason it may be required is, in his view, because it is beneficial to the one end of knowing God better. And it's the love affair with God that Martin Luther had that he wanted to share with everyone that is one of the driving forces of Protestantism. Sola Scriptura, justification by faith, but love God with your whole heart. That's what drives Protestantism. And so, this principle was once summed up by an Anglican priest I know in Toronto, who said in relation to um, people hearing confession, that none are required, all may, and some probably should. But what about the Catholic and the Orthodox? We've seen them in the other videos. What are they up to? Well, Roman Catholic reform came in the shape of what we used to call the Counter-Reformation, but is now more appropriately called the Catholic Reformation. 
because they had a great desire to reform in many of the same areas as Protestants, just not always in the same direction. And they had a big council called the Council of Trent from the 1540s to 1560s that I can't get into because there's just not enough time. But one area in need of reform was the monastic movement. So let's look at two reforming Carmelites, shall we? These are the two most famous Carmelites of all time, and they were friends, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross. Teresa, in fact, is the person who convinced John to become a Carmelite. He originally wanted to be Carthusian, take a vow of silence, do nothing but pray all the time. Um, but he joined her with this desire to reform the Carmelite movement in Spain. And this would get them, especially John, into all sorts of trouble. The poor guy got imprisoned by rival Carmelites once, and he had to make a daring escape out the window of a tower. So don't go telling me that mystics don't lead exciting lives. Let me tell you, there's more to these people than you might imagine. And mysticism is not just a bunch of ecstatic experiences like we see in the famous sculpture by Bernini of St. Teresa in Ecstasy. First and foremost, Saints Teresa and John call Christians to prayer, no matter what the trials they're going through are. And St. Teresa was also a great reader, so in the discipline of study, she studied the scriptures and she studied St. Augustine. Martin Luther also studied St. Augustine. Hmm. In his most famous work, The Dark Knight of the Soul, St. John of the Cross goes through the seven deadly sins and their spiritual manifestation recommending the life of the disciplines and full trust in God as the cure. Both of them declare, whether in a mystical work like the interior castle of St. Teresa or elsewhere as in her autobiography, that all encounters with God are dependent on his grace. But also, there are things that we people can do to become more attuned to him and more ready for his approach. Meeting with God, as I discussed in video two, in relation to John Cassian, is the entire purpose of the spiritual disciplines. In the East, orthodoxy continued in the Ottoman Empire. In the Mediterranean world, the monastic foundations on Mount Athos in Greece and St. Catharines in Sinai continued to draw both pilgrims and new monks from throughout the orthodox world. I'll talk about Athos a bit more next week. Monasteries continued to be founded within the borders of expanding Russian power, although we must know Close ties with kings, not always the safest route for monks. One time, Ivan the Terrible was in a really bad mood, and he was stopped off to visit the Piskov Caves Monastery. St. Cornelius of the Piskov Caves came down to welcome the Tsar, and the Tsar was just really, really mad, so he cut the guy's head off. Bit of a, a fortunate, fortunate thing to have happen. Ivan was a really, really upset about the fact that he had done this. In 1700, Peter the Great, the famous westernizer of Russia, published an edict calling for the evangelization of Siberia and China, although there were already orthodox missions in China from the 1600s. In 1702, this call was answered by Philothe of Kiev, who was made Metropolitan of Tobolsk and all Siberia to, quote, lead the natives in China and Siberia to the service of the true and living God. He would found 37 churches by the time of his death in 1711. Which brings us to our third topic today, European missionary expansion. Let's start with the Jesuits, shall we? After all, it seems only right that Canadians, I'm mean, even filming this on Canada Day, should think about Jesuit missions. Now, the Society of Jesus, as the Jesuits are formally called, was started in the 16th century by Ignatius Loyola as a spiritual army, um, true soldiers for Christ, not Teutonic Knights, um, but actual monkish people, but organized along discipline, taking inspiration from the military, which Ignatius had himself um, spent a bit of time in. And they were fighting to reform the Roman Catholic Church on the one hand, and fight Protestantism on the other. Their zeal for the Roman Catholic faith was such that they, like the Franciscans before them, soon became missionaries, going beyond the correction or conversion of Europeans, to encounters with new peoples in faraway lands. One place where they established missionary efforts was St. Marie among the Hurons, near what is now today Midland, Ontario, which obviously wasn't there yet. The mission itself began in 1615 among the Wendat people, and uh, St. Marie among the Hurons served as a base for the Jesuits, who built the actual mission station in 1634, when, no, sorry, they came in 1634, built the station in 1639, 
and at its busiest in 1648, they had 19 priests, four lay brothers, 23 Dolonais, four boys, seven domestics, and eight soldiers. These Jesuit missionaries worked hard to learn the customs of the Wendat people and to bring them the message of Christianity. One example of their commitment to making Christianity understandable in the terms of a non-European culture um, is in fact the Huron Carol by Saint-Jean de Brébeuf. T'was in the moon of winter time when all the birds had fled that mighty Gitchy managed to send angel choirs instead. Very famous, as you all no doubt know. I would like to take this moment to apologize to Saint-Jean de Brébeuf and the Wendat people for the 1926 English version, which is not even a translation out of Wendat, of the Huron Carol, which I just sang. And hopefully we Anglophone white Christians can do better in the future. However, in 1648, hostility between the Wendat and Iroquois arose, and the Jesuits were particular targets of the Iroquois. Five Jesuit fathers lost their lives. Antoine Daniel, Jean de Brébeuf, Gabriel Lallemand, Charles Garnier, and Noël Chabanel between 1648 and 1649. Samory among the Hurons was abandoned. These were not the only Jesuits of the 17th century to suffer and die in bringing Christianity to non-Europeans. I am sure we are all now painfully aware of the ordeals of the Jesuits in Japan. So powerfully and masterfully depicted in Martin Scorsese's film adaptation of Shusaku Endo's novel, Silence. In the 16th and 17th centuries, these were the age of European expansion. My, our, if we're white watching this, our ancestors, they conquered the Americas. They found new routes to Asia. They opened up seafaring trading links with India and China. They circumcised, I mean, they circumnavigated the world and very often whether alongside a colony's governor or on the deck of a merchant ship, missionaries came with them, expanding the reach of Roman Catholicism and Protestantism from what is really actually a really, it's a very small part of the map, Western Europe, to around the world. Some of the churches established in the New Lands were largely actually white affairs. Colonial churches for colonial populations, using colony in the specific sense of a transplanted population from one place to another. Others did have a stronger evangelistic and missionary impulse, whose end result has been the establishment of indigenous churches throughout the world. Oh, but that's that week's topic, isn't it? In closing, Christianity in 1700 was not Christianity in 1500. Western European Christianity had exploded and had been sundered into many pieces and more bits have been falling off ever since. The Orthodox and Ottoman lands were focused on the monastic world and how to ensure the preservation of their rich traditions of liturgy, prayer, and theology, scripture reading, and holiness, whereas the Russians were interested in establishing the church beyond their own boundaries. The Diocese of Kazan had been formed by Ivan the Terrible, conquering it himself in the 1500s. Siberia and China, on the other hand, would be formed, would be evangelized, whether the Tsar sent any troops or not. I mean, he did, but anyway. Likewise, in the wake of the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria, Western European missionaries would expand the reach of their churches to new horizons in the Americas, in India, where they met the Martoma Christians living peaceably with their neighbors, in China and in Japan, although in Japan they were literally killed off. Next week, we will look at the story of how Christianity became a truly global faith, as well as at the challenges that face true discipleship when nationalism claims Christianity. Thank you very much.